make sure they're recording it for the people who are watching online, coast to coast. No, I don't know. So, uh, hey guys, thanks for rolling out this morning, uh, Saturday morning. It's, it's just beautiful. We got up. Man, it's, uh, love it. I love this weather outside. It's like California in the morning. It feels good. Okay, so we're going to look at the vocabulary of disciple making. Why, vocabulary is important because we talked about last night. If we were to uh, put 10 people up here in the front and ask them, uh, what's the definition of discipleship? What, what's discipleship? You could have 10 different answers. And the idea, I think, in a church, you need to have a common vocabulary. It's very helpful. So if these, if these, if these definitions help you, great. Maybe your own fellowship would come up with your own definitions. But this is a good starting place for us. So we're going to, to define it. So I'm just going to run through these, these quickly. Uh, the first one is uh, just talking about what, what's discipleship. Discipleship is simply the process of following Jesus. We're following Jesus. You guys are familiar. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Maybe somebody has that for us. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Really a key verse in the Christian life. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Whoever has it first, just go ahead and say, I got it. Got it. Okay, go ahead and read that for us, Nancy. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. First of all, we need to deny ourselves, take up our cross every once in a while. You know, it says take up our cross daily. Dying to ourselves and being willing, if we have to, maybe one day we may have to die for the Lord. Just being able to take up our cross and to follow Him. To follow Him fully. So discipleship, the process of simply is following Jesus. The next one is disciple. Disciple, it's, uh, an example is, it's a, uh, a student, a follower, an apprentice. These are some ideas. A student, a learner, an apprentice, a follower of Jesus. The word disciple is used 269 times. 269 times in just the Gospels, four Gospels in the book of Acts. And the, the word Christian is used only three times. So the idea is, the disciple is really emphasized in those first few books. So just a, a thought for us. Disciple is a student, a learner. And the next one, disciple making. We learned last night that's our, uh, the, the main verb in the Great Commission is talking about making disciples. Making disciples. It's, um, it's a person that God uses to intentionally invest in somebody else. A person that God uses to intentionally invest in someone else. It means to be relational. We talked about that last night, to be a friend to somebody. You come alongside them and say, hey, I, I know the way. I've been following the Lord. Or If you're a new believer, if you've only been saved for a week or so, two weeks, you can teach them what, what God's already taught you. You don't have to have all the answers. You just, we talked about this last night. Following Jesus, be a half a step ahead of the other person and moving toward Jesus and giving them what God's given you, what you're learning you give to somebody else. So it's relational. And also, guys, it's sanctifying. This is a key part about making disciples. If we're just kind of being consumers sitting in the church, we become very passive. But the idea about being, it's a sanct it has a sanctifying effect. Let's look at John 17, verse 19. Let me turn there. John 17, 19. John chapter 17. This is the, it's been called the high priestly prayer. This is when Jesus prays for his men in the garden. The men that God had given him. John 17. And it's in verse 19. John 17. So in this, in this chapter, there are 26 verses. But Jesus prays for his men. He talks about the ones you've given me. And I pray for them. Over and over, he mentions them. It's about like 42 times. He mentions he's, he's praying for the men, the ones that God had given him to invest in. 
So it's a, it's a sanct- it has a sanctifying effect. Look at this in verse 19. Now this is Jesus speaking. Jesus himself, he says, And for their sakes, talking about the disciples, I sanctify myself. I set myself apart to God that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So it's a sanctifying effect because when you're making disciples, you think, what sin do I want to pass along to somebody else? I want to be making, making sure I'm walking in holiness, following Jesus, because I don't want to infect somebody else by what's happening in my life. So you want to be pure. You want to walk with God. So it has a sanctifying effect. If Jesus himself, he says, I sanctify myself for these men. We also need to have that, that life of desire for holiness, the desire to be sanctified. Okay, and then here's a definition. I want you guys to write this down. We're just going to do kind of old school. Um, I'm going to put this together in a PowerPoint. But uh, just for today, we'll just kind of say it a few times. Maybe it'll be a way for us to uh, also um, just to memorize it. So here's, here's one of our favorite definitions. <clears throat> this, is, this is a definition we use in Downline. So, um, disciple making, what it is, it's truth and life transference. Disciple making is truth and life transference. Truth and life transference. In the context of authentic relationships, it's truth and life transference. In the context of authentic relationships. And whoever's going to edit this later on, they can go and just kind of get my last one when they have it all together instead of taking it step by step. It's uh, truth in life transference in the context of authentic relationships. I like this part. It says for the purpose, truth in life transference in the context of authentic relationships for the purpose of producing reproducers. Truth in life transference in the context of authentic relationships for the purpose of producing reproducers of Jesus Christ. In the context of authentic relationships, for the purpose of producing reproducers of Jesus Christ. And we'll look at this right here, uh, kind of step by step. Truth in life. You think, where do they get that? Truth in life. Look at 1 Thessalonians, it's chapter 2, verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians 2, verse 8. This is a key verse in disciple making. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. And in this verse, it's like bookends. It begins, the verse begins with love and it ends in love. First Thessalonians 2, 8. So here's what we do. <laughs> That's good. That's fine. That's fine. So 1 Thessalonians 2 8. That's okay. Uh, let's go. 1 Thessalonians 2 8. So it starts out with, uh, with love and it ends in love. Let's see. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, it says, so affectionately longing for you. That's it starts out there, that love. It says, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, that's truth. And also life, it says, but also our own lives. So you see truth and life. So you're passing along truth, the word of God, and life. It's a friendship we talked about. Truth and life in the context of authentic relationships. Why? For the purpose of producing reproducers of Jesus Christ. We talked about multiplication. It's not just trying to get my, trying to smuggle my soul to heaven. That's not the idea. I want to take as many people as I can with me by evangelism and also building into others so that way they can reach others too. So it's truth and life transference in the context of authentic relationships, not to try to be something you're not, just be real. Authentic relationships. And sometimes guys, I think they, people can learn a lot from our mistakes. Because when you, we, we say, well, if we start discipling people and I get close to somebody, they're gonna see some of the holes I have. Well, yeah, all of us have holes. Nobody's got it all together. And sometimes whenever we, we do, they can learn from our mistakes. And if, if that's true, we always have plenty of material to teach. Yes. So as we're just walking with people, and we need to be authentic enough whenever we do, our attitude is not right, or we say something we shouldn't, or whatever. We come to them and say, hey, that was wrong. 
I, I shouldn't have said that. That was unnecessary. Before you speak, you've heard this before. You think, is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Is it true, necessary, or kind? Ephesians 4.29 says that uh, everything we, sh we say should be building up people, not to try to tear them down. It's a great verse to memorize, Ephesians 4.29. So, 1 Thessalonians 2.8. We'll read it again, 1 Thessalonians 2.8. It says, so affectionately longing for you. Paul loved these people in Thessalonica. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our very lives, our own lives. Why, Why Paul? It says, because you had become dear to us. So he loves these people. So it's truth and life transference in the process of truth and life transference in, in the context of authentic relationships for the purpose of producing reproducers of Jesus Christ. Okay, then we go to the last one. We're going to talk about disciplines. Uh, disciplines. And it's not just about, you know, I'm trying to gut this thing out. And, um, but disciplines are not the goal. We talked about this last night. Disciplines are not the goal, but they help us reach the goal of God conforming us to the image of Christ. Uh, and here's some, some examples of some disciplines I think it's good to have in our life. Uh, disciplines have been called uh, practices. We're practicing these disciplines, just like any sport. In basketball, we would shoot over and over and over. And, and just where it's just all of its muscle memory. The more you do something, I, I've been watching the Olympics at night when I get home looking at the, the highlights. And you see the way these people swim, how many hours and hours and hours they've been swimming for maybe two minutes, two minute, a two minute event or less for that, how much effort they put into it. And the thing is, are we willing to put as much effort in as these Olympic athletes into our Christian lives, these disciplines that we have? So here are some examples of some disciplines that are good to have in our lives. Uh, time with God, just being with Him, spending time with God. It's not just you know reading the Bible and checking the box, okay, I knocked that out today, but spending time in His presence, being with Him. Praying, listening. A lot of prayer is listening. It's not just me always flapping my gums. It needs to be listening to God. This one guy said he prays uh, about like four hours a day, he said. And some guy said, man, I don't know if I could talk for four hours. That's a long time. And he said, well, I don't do a lot of talking. I do a lot of listening. So it's listening to God, uh, studying, meditating on Scripture, memorizing. I was really encouraged. I went to be a part of Bill's uh, small group the other night. And as we started out, um, they were memorizing scripture. And so they're able to go through their verses. So that's hiding God's word in our heart. Meditating, memorizing scripture. Worship. Just worship it by, your, by yourself in your room or at your house. There with your brothers and sisters uh, in, in the local fellowship, worshiping together. Uh, witnessing. I think witnessing is a discipline we should have. Uh, we, we're going to talk about this a little bit later today. But to have a scheduled time, it's good to have a scheduled time, but also as you have a scheduled time to go out, also you have a time to, because uh, if you're scheduling going out, chances are through the rest of the week you're thinking, oh, it's in the front of your mind. It's not something that's in the back, on the back burner. You're thinking about it. And as you see people, you're interacting with them. You want to share the good news with them. So witnessing, also fasting. Fasting isn't really thought of much. We don't talk a lot about it. Uh, here in the U.S., man, we got food channels. We got uh, people call themselves foodies and all this. Man, just we're like barraged with food. Hey, I love food. I love a good meal. And talk about our Greek restaurant. This is not, not, not a plug, but, you know, it's this Greek restaurant. My goodness. Whew. Okay. So, uh, but fasting. Set aside uh, some time to not eat. Uh, for specific spiritual purposes. You're praying for something or you just want to be closer to God and, and it's not like I'm trying to do this to twist God's arm to make him do what I'm asking him to do. No, it's going without food for that time. And it, it, I tell a lot of young guys, um, older guys too, that whenever they're battling sin, it's one of the best ways. Uh, Bill Bright, he called it the spiritual atomic bomb that uh, you're battling the flesh. 
What you could do, you're going without food for a specified amount of time, drinking water, and check with your doctor. We don't want to lose anybody. Make sure everything's good. And so, uh, but going without food for that specified amount of time, and you're seeking the Lord, and you're, the flesh, it becomes weaker, and your, your spirit becomes stronger. So just, that, just a little thought on that on fasting. Also service, having some type of ministry that you want to be involved with, that you want to serve. Also being yielded, submission. Also uh, solitude. This, we talked about that, time with God, just to be quiet. We got so we were talking last night with Bill. We were talking last night about so many distractions in the U.S. So many distractions right now. Uh, you'll see people walking around their their phone. They're not even looking at anybody. You go to an airport. Everybody's got their face in their phone. They're not even acknowledging somebody sitting across from them. Before people just sit and chat. Hey, where are you from? Where are you headed? Nowadays, people feel like they're uptight and they just they're in their phone. Like I'm I'm important or I mean, sometimes people are working. I get that. But sometimes it's just like a reflex. Instead of thinking, how can I interact with somebody? Evangelism begins with hello. Just simply talking to somebody, striking up a conversation. So time to be quiet. Just some ideas on disciplines. So uh, just a quick review. Um, just the whole thing about uh, discipleship, the process of simply following Jesus, a disciple, uh, someone who's a learner, a follower, a disciple maker. God's using you to invest in somebody else. And also disciplines. These are the tools, the holy habits that we can put in our life. Not, not as the goal, but to help us to reach the goal of being more conformed to the image of Christ. Okay. How does everybody feel? That's just a little quick one. I got one more. I have one more. I want us to, um, to look at. This is called the master plan of evangelism. Or the Jesus' way to make disciples. It could be called that also. It's a book that was written by Robert Coleman in the early 60s. He comes to our institute. Uh, you know, uh, it's not good to name drop. You know, I was talking to the queen the other day, and I told her it's just not good. I shouldn't name drop, you know, about it. I'm joking. Uh, it's kind of like a joke. Okay, so, <laughs> tough crowd right here. <laughs> okay, so, so, uh, so Robert Coleman, he comes to our institute, so I get to go pick him up at the airport and take him around, take him to a place where we have for him to stay, and he's just a godly granddad. My goodness, he's like a, uh, the granddad you always wish you had, just a godly man, early 90s, uh, just a, a super guy. And he, he I, I see him, and I say, I want to be like him. If I make it to 90-something, I would like to be like him. So he wrote this book. And uh, what he did, he started, he was studying the life of Jesus and he would invite his college or his seminary students to come be with him to read through the gospels together and pray. And that's the way he started seeing these principles. After about the third year, he started seeing these principles emerge from the page. And he wrote the book, the, how Jesus did uh, ministry or, or the master plan of evangelism. If you haven't read it, um, maybe fast for a day. And uh, take the money you'd spend for food and go buy the book. Yeah. Buy that book, guys. It's a great book. And they're, they're probably, used bookstore, they'll have them for like 50 cents or something, a buck. It'll be the best. Uh, it's just a great, a great overview about how Jesus did ministry. So it starts out, Jesus is in the incarnation. He came to dwell among us. Uh, he wanted to be close to us, so he came to dwell among us. He, Jesus came in humility. So the first word is incarnation. Write that down if you would, please. Incarnation. In some verses off to the side for that topic is Philippians 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Jesus came in humility. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. A classic passage on, on Jesus uh, coming to dwell among us. And people, people were attracted to Jesus. And, and the question is, are people attracted to us? Do we have the fragrance of Jesus in our lives? Do we repel people? Or are people attracted to us? And it should be the Jesus in us as we let Jesus have more and more control of us. So incarnation is the first one. He came to, to dwell among us. He came in humility. And if we come in humility, guys, we'll always have opportunities to minister to other people. Next one is selection. Selection, 
uh, Jesus, he, he couldn't invest deeply in everybody. And if Jesus can't do it, you can't either. So there have, you have to be selective. And uh, maybe the people you identify with, and I was, it was in a small group, uh, Bill's small group the other night, and I, I just saw people there and I thought, you know, um, from that small group, you could say, hey, uh, I, I'm going to come, come to my place in the morning on Saturday mornings or whatever, and we're going to go through the scripture together, we're going to pray together, we're going to do it at 5 a.m., and it kind of filters people out. The people who want to be there, they will be there. I remember there was a, our pastor in Memphis, Adrian Rogers. If he had said something, hey, at 3.30, guys, I want you to meet at my house, baby, I'd be there. I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter what time. I would like to get time with the guy. He had so much that uh, he'd been walking with God for years. Is that me? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> so, uh, so selection. Uh, we can't spend our time on everybody. We focus on a few for the benefit of everybody else. So look at some characteristics. Um, well, let me give you these verses. Luke 6, 12 through 17. That kind of fits in with the whole idea of selection. Luke chapter 6, 12 through 17. It talks about Jesus before he, um, before he made the big decision about selecting the men that would walk with him. He spent the whole night in prayer. And that's, uh, that's a good example. We need to pray them in. It's not just, well, this guy, is, uh, he's got a square jaw. He's together. He's a good businessman. He may not be the person. God may be working in other people's lives, and we need to be praying about who are the ones that, uh, Lord, who are the ones you want me to, to invest in? Because God knows the end from the beginning. He knows who he's going to use. So we need to be open and prayerful about for the women. Women say, who are the women that I'm going to invest in? For our friends here, we got Lydia and Greta spending time with young people. And you think, hey, uh, is there decide? They can't spend their time on everybody, but they can minister to these young women and build into them. So that way, when they go on to the next thing and in their life, um, that they, there's there they can do the same thing to keep that going to minister to other people. So here's some qualities I like to look for. Uh, people that they're faithful. You've heard this before. Faithful? Are they teachable? Excuse me. Are they eager to learn? Are they motivated? We talked about last night. Uh, you need to find people who know that they don't know and they want to know. They have a hunger to learn. Some people are satisfied. They don't need that. There's a guy, uh, Tommy Nelson. He's a, a pastor in Texas. He comes to teach at our institute. And he said, you always have to have in a church, you have to have uh, like a, there, there are, the way he described it is you need to have a track or a way for the racehorses to let them run. The ones who want to run, there's some people that they're content just to kind of show up at the church house, pray and say hello to people and get a sermon. There are other people, they want to run. You, you want to spend time with the racehorses because the ones you spend time with them, they'll be able to help you with the others. So spend time with the leaders, the people who are motivated, available. They have a heart for God. They, have a, they love God's word. Only God can put that in them. I can, I can inspire and try to encourage, but only God can do that. So the heart for the Bible, and maybe they already involved, they're already involved in some kind of ministry. We talked about last night, don't spend your life carving rotten wood. Number three, association. We need to spend time with them. Time. Jesus spent, we talked about that last night, 85% of his ministry was with these guys, these 12 disciples. And the, the verse there is Mark 3.14. Association. As you go to do ministry, take people with you. Never do ministry alone. Have people with you as you go do ministry because you're training. They're there with you. They're watching. They're learning. And they're learning without knowing they're learning. That's the best way to learn. They're just watching. They're observing. So association. Jesus spent about, about 15,000 hours with these guys. I added it up. Say if, he, he, if Jesus slept eight hours a day and for three years... Take 85% of that. It's about 15,000 hours he spent. And to think that we can make disciples on a kind of a, an assembly line basis, it's not going to happen. We need to be intentional to invest in them, bring them into our life. Next one, number four, is consecration. 
consecration. The verses are Luke 9, 23 and 24. Luke 9, 23 and 24. We just read that this morning. Uh, Jesus expected obedience. Jesus simply said, follow me. And he didn't want to spend time with rebels. He wasn't going to invest with people who were going to be rebels. Uh, it will cost you everything to follow Jesus. It will cost you your life. Robert Murray Machane, he said, Lord, he had a prayer. Lord, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be. Make me as holy as a saved sinner can be. That's consecration. Next, impartation. Well, we'll do, we'll do impartation at the last. Next one is demonstration. Demonstration is uh, Luke 11, 1. Jesus was praying and they, it was such a notable part of his life that they watched him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. So demonstration. And we learn better through uh, demonstration. Luke 11, 1. Number seven, these are just quick. Just to, just to show this to you guys and encourage you guys to, to read the book. Delegation. Uh, Jesus gave them something to do. And this is the danger where we can do all of the work and not get other people involved. We need to get other people involved in the work. If I'm doing a Sunday school class, I need to delegate. Have them, hey, can you lead the prayer time? And show them how to do that. Train them. And then they do the prayer time. They, they do part of the lesson. And I do part of the lesson. After that, they're doing all of the lesson. That's what I would do with Sergio when I was in Honduras. We started working with the kids 9 to 11 years old. Uh, the boys 9 to 11 years old. And uh, man, he, uh, he took off like crazy. Just, just He started doing it. And then after that, he was doing the whole thing. And I would sit in the back and observe. And I would make notes. And I said, hey, that was good. And we'd do like a little debrief at the end. And I was always going to give him a lot of, um, a lot of encouragement. And if there's any adjustments that had to be made, I would, I would make a, a sandwich. You guys have heard that before. You got two pieces of bread. One piece of bread is encouragement. And then you got the meat in the middle is a, the adjustment. Hey, Sergio, I've, I've seen God use you in these last few years. My goodness, you're growing like crazy. And uh, it's just a blessing to see you, what God's doing in your life. And hey, what do you think about if we use this, this illustration, this is the meat, this illustration right here, use this, or maybe another verse, what do you think? And then at the end, man, I'm so excited to see what God's going to do through your life in the years ahead. And God's using him in a wonderful way right now, as pastoring up in, uh, on the north coast of Honduras. Uh, so demonstration, uh, with delegation, yeah, you're giving them something to do. Supervision, that's where you make the adjustments. That's in Luke 9, 54 and 55. Supervision. Whenever we delegate something, we're going to have to make some adjustments. There's going to have to be some adjustments probably. Here's the saying, we don't get what we, we, what we expect, we get what we inspect. We don't get what we expect, we get what we inspect. A lot of encouragement. And then multiplication is uh, John 15, John 15, 16, the first part. Let's read that, John 15. John 15, verse 16, the first part of that, A. John 15, 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to, that you should go and bear fruit. So we didn't, we, he selected us. We didn't choose him. He's the one who drew us to himself. So the idea is just building into people. We talked about multiplication last night. And the last part is impartation. Really the, how it all <laughs> holds together. Impartation. We have a helper. and That's uh, John 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine. Help me, help me with this. You guys know the verse? I am the vine. You are the... Branches, he who abides in me, and I will bear, how much fruit, how much fruit? Much. much fruit, for without me you can do 20%, without me you can do 10%, no, without me you can do zero, nothing. So I have a special, special glove, I brought this all the way from Memphis, and I said, you know, my friends up in New York, 
I want them to see this. The special glove is, it can do all kinds of things. It can hold a microphone, it can wave, it can uh, yeah, hold up a Bible, it can do all kinds of stuff. So I brought this, so I'm going to say uh, special glove. Now, we practiced this before, so make sure you're ready. You ready? Okay, we got about uh, 25 people here. And I want you to do your thing, all right? Special glove, you ready? Go, do it, you're on. Hey, you're supposed to do something. We talked about this. He needs encouragement. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. No, that's not going to happen. You say, pepper your nuts. I am a little bit. But this, this glove is our life. Without Jesus, there's no life. We're dead. The Bible talks about Ephesians 2. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. When Jesus comes on the inside, his life comes into ours. Now the glove can do whatever the hand can do. It's not my ability. It's his power, his ability in me. Now the, hand, now the glove can hold up a microphone, can hold up a Bible, can wave, can do all kinds of things. The power is what's on the inside. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Hope you never forget that. So going back to the, to the beginning, incarnation, Jesus came as a servant. Selection, you can't invest your life in everybody. Association, Jesus spent time with them. It's called the with me principle, time with them together. Consecration, he's not going to invest himself on rebels. Demonstration, it's your, he was showing them what to do. You're modeling it first. Delegation, he got them involved. Delegation, after that supervision, he had to make some adjustments. Multiplication, it's, uh, it's going to be expanding. He came to uh, choose us to bear much fruit. And after that, impartation, it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, guys, if, we're not, if the Holy Spirit isn't involved in our, our work of making disciples, it's not going to amount to anything. It's just a lot of activity. We need to be uh, dependent on the Holy Spirit. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a little break. And we're going to the, let the, the lovely young women, they're going to be going upstairs to be with Angelica. She's going to be teaching. And then Bill is going to be here. He's going to do some training with the men. And what we're going to do, we're going to pray. And then we can make our way up there. Uh, I'm excited about after that, we're going to be talking about evangelism. We're going to be showing you a simple model that you guys will be able to go out today and share the good news with somebody. Okay? Let's pray, and we're going to get, uh, get busy. Lord, uh, thank you for uh, this group of people uh, here in New York from these different churches. Lord, I pray that uh, we would be people who abide in you, and your spirit would be uh, controlling us. And, Lord, that there would be multiplication taking place. Lord, I pray that you would uh, make all of us here in this room, people who are listening online, or at a later date, video, however, that you would make us multipliers. That you would make us uh, people. We're not satisfied just to go, to go to heaven by ourselves. We want to take as many people with us. So use us, Lord, as we abide in you and invest in other people, teaching them, training them. And just the same way that you did with your disciples. So Lord, use this time, this remaining time today, in all of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.